On the handout, I do have the general gist of what we've covered. You know, we've, uh, we, in my perspective, is to divide the book of Exodus into two main parts. One is the redemption from Egypt, which is chapters 1 through, 9, 1 through 18, and we covered that in the first four parts. Now we're beginning the second part, which I call the covenant with God, and that's from Exodus 19 through 40. Now we're not going through Exodus 19 through 40 today, we're just going to go through Exodus 19 through 24, and even that we have to go fast, because that's a lot of material to cover. I mean, we, we can take a 30 times, we can take 30 different Bible studies to cover something like this, but we're going through it, at least introducing the subject, hopefully you'll go home and study it and get more depth on it. So parts one, we talked about who wrote the book of Exodus and how did Israel end up in Egypt. Part two was the affliction of the children of Israel and how God prepared Moses and how Moses went to see Pharaoh. Part three, we talked about the ways that he was, God worked through words, a miracle, plagues, blood, and water. And the purpose of all the Exodus was to show that he was the eternal. He was the Lord. He, he did have a message entitled, Let My People Go, but God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that was an interesting study about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. I still would love to have interactive, more interactive study on that because that is just so illuminating to me about what that concept means. The last time we talked about the initial reaction of joy when they came out of Egypt and the people soon complained, but then there was a preservation. By the preservation was God answered prayers, how God made it good for them in, in, in that situation, how he answered prayers in their life. So now we come to part five. We've come to the point now where we're done through chapters 18, up to 18. They've escaped from Egypt. Uh, they, well, they've come through the water. They had their reaction. And now the three points we're going to cover today is the first point will be God mentioned a covenant. Uh, God gave the commandments and judgments. And then there was a formal ratification of the covenant. And again, we'll start with Exodus chapter 19, if you want to follow along in the scripture. Exodus chapter 19, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephelim and had come to the desert of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the, the mountain. Verse 3, Moses sent up to God, went up to God, excuse me, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel. It's very common in the, in the book of Exodus and other parts of the Bible where God will say, Tell this to the people, and sometimes that'll be like 15 verses, and then all of a sudden Moses goes down and tells the people, and the people react. So here's God telling Moses, Here's what I want you to say. You, you have seen, verse 4, what I did to the Egyptians, and how I, how I have you as, as eagles' wings and brought you out of the, to myself. I want you to think about that for a second, and I, I think this is a great point of understanding, a caution I like to regularly give. I like to regularly give to people not to get too literal with the English words in the Bible. The Bible's written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, and so thereby they're translated. And, of course, there's a big discussion about which translation should be used. I have friends who are very particular about the translation they use. I use, personally, just a way of reference, I use the New King James, but I like to compare to other translations. I like to use a lot of variety of translations. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, Greek scholar, Aramaic scholar. I can use a concordance and try to do so, but I try to use different translations. But whatever translation you use... My caution to you is be careful not to get caught up on the English word. Now, understand that God wrote a lot of things in parables, in metaphors, and that's good. In fact, that was one of Jesus' main speaking tools. You read about the parables. When he, read, when he gave a parable, he gave a parable to make a point. It was like a, 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 an effective illustration to make a point. And we like to caution people not to make a doctrine based on a parable because the parable may have a certain point it's making, but the English word can actually can cause someone to go off on a tangent. Be careful because many fundamentalists, and I like to caution you to be, beware of a fundamentalist. Beware of fundamentalist Buddhist, 
beware fundamentalist Muslims, beware fundamentalist Christians, beware fundamentalist Church of God. By that I mean someone who will then extract certain parts of the Bible in such a way that they will handcuff themselves and they will act as doorkeepers to the kingdom of God. So be careful of that. <clears throat> Example, why am I making this point? <clears throat> because verse 4, <clears throat> he said, I took you on eagle's wings. There's a place in the New Testament, and sometimes it's been called the doctrine of the place of safety by fundamentalist churches of God, where they think people are going to go somewhere to a certain spot at a certain time, and those fundamentalist churches of God will say the only way you can get there is by being loyal to them. So if you can recognize that, that can be a control mechanism of you have to listen to them, you have to be allied with them, you have to be your allegiance to them or you won't be protected in a place of safety. What happens though is the place of safety, when he talks that about in Revelation 12, he says they go on eagle's wings. And so I, I told you about one of my friends who attended this congregation who came up to me one day and said, he probably called me Mr. Haver. He may have called me Dave. I, I would have, wouldn't have cared if he called me Dave. But if he said, you don't believe in there's just one place of safety, do you? I said, no, sir, I do not. I do not believe that. I said, if God wants to have one place of safety, he's the boss. Whatever he wants, he can have. But I personally don't believe there's just one place of safety. I believe he can protect us in lots of different ways, lots of different situations. And the man said, what about Revelation? And I quickly interrupted him and said, Revelation 12, 14. I knew what verse he was going to because the verse Revelation 12, 14 said he would go into her place on eagle's wings. So it says her place. He said, notice it says on eagle's wings. So you think an eagle's going to fly into your house and you're going to grab on the back of that eagle and the eagle's going to fly you to a place of safety. And by the way, for some of us, it'd have to be a pretty big eagle. <laughs> so here you can get back on the eagle's wing and it flies me to a place of safety. And he said, no, that's, that's, that's symbolic. I said, oh, so you recognize the beautiful writings of the Bible are sometimes very symbolic and very beautiful. I think the symbolism is beautiful. How did they go on eagle's wings back in Exodus? They walked. So if someone were to say, well, eagle's wings means what it means, it could mean walking. What it means is God's going to protect you. God's going to get you there even if you walk. And if you walk and are tired, he's going to help you. Will he give you manna? He did it once before. He, he may not have to give manna again, but he will make sure. Of course, the New Testament manna is Christ, the bread of life. So the New Testament example is he will give you the bread of life to help you on your journey. So that's pretty clear, isn't it? So I caution you again, be very careful when people take English words and build a whole case around the English word about eagle's wings. It's a beautiful metaphor that served its purpose well. And I'll tell you what, if you don't care for that, you'll have to take it up with God and the authors and the writers of the Bible because I, I, like, the, I like the metaphors of the scripture. Some of the prophecies are just so beautiful. And don't, get, don't be fooled though, those beautiful metaphors have a very important point. In fact, they very efficiently make a very effective point. But I want to point that out. I take every chance I can on that because we are not a fundamentalist Church of God group. And I hope people who listen to us on the website really are hold on to the great things of the Church of God, but don't get into the fundamentalist approach, which is usually the approach of the Pharisees and Sadducees. and gets into approach of really condemn, condemnation, and we, we want to help people get out of that. But anyway, he said, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you out to myself by walking. But now here's the reaction where we come to the covenant. Therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you'll be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. We discussed this in the interactive Bible study at 1 o'clock. We talked about that. First of all, this is repeated by the apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2. So he takes on the theme, Peter takes on the theme of being a special nation. Now, the first comment that was made in the interactive study is people who believe this, as I do and you do, have to be careful not to get the big head, not to get to the point of thinking, oh, we're special to the point that we get condescending. 
If we take any part of the Bible to let us fill us with pride, that is not appropriate. So we definitely don't want to be filled with pride. If anything, we want to be filled with humility of saying, wow, if this is what he's helping us to see, what can I do to respond to it? How can I respond to it better? Not, not in a way to look down on anyone else, but just realize what an opportunity, what a responsibility. And so when you look at the covenant, it's not a covenant of how you're special. You're not, you're not in the Hall of Fame. You're not in the Christian Hall of Fame. You know, you didn't win an Emmy or an Oscar for the Christian world. You know, it's, it's a matter of you're getting an opportunity to serve and you get to, to really dig in there, not only to love God, but try to love people as well. But the covenant was, I'm giving you something I'd like you to do. Here's what I've offered. Here's what I've done for you. I've delivered you from sin. I've delivered you from bondage. I've delivered you from Egypt. Now I want to tell you what I think I would like you to do. Now if the attitude is, well, you demand too much, we've already become ungrateful. If, or as the attitude is, yes, sir, what did you, you've delivered me. You've helped me to escape. You've offered me all these blessings. What do you want from me? What can make you happy? How can I serve you? How can I go about reflecting you? And of course, that is the approach of a, an our obedience. That's the approach I recommend in our obedience. I do not recommend a fear religion where people are like quivering about what's, what's God going to do and how, how's he going to get us if we do wrong. I, I, don't, I don't endorse that at all. I, I, kind of, I like what the Apostle John mentioned about perfect love casts out fear. I, I believe that. I also believe that the Bible talks about respecting God. For sure, we need to respect God, but that's not quivering, quaking fear. I know you can look for scriptures and make that case, but I hope you'll look at, and you can look at all the scriptures and, and make the case of God's love. He's, he is saying here, I want to make an agreement with you. And he's telling, he's telling them about the agreement. So he mentioned the covenant. Uh, let's see. Uh, he talked about, and in verse 7, he goes back to tell them, you know, God had told this to Moses, so Moses went back and tell them what God had said. Notice verse 8. And all the, the people said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. You know, we've not done this at baptism, but wouldn't that be interesting, baptism? If you came out of the water and said, all that the Lord has spoken, I will do. Uh, and even though you, you and I haven't said those words, that's basically what we're saying when we accept his mercy. We're saying to him, all that you say, I will do. By the way, can you see where confusion comes in then? A lot of times I tell people about faith, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about faith. And again, I mentioned this over in Mississippi last week. I mentioned it here often. Hope is very important. What are the three things that God says last? Faith, hope, and love. So people focus on that faith one, and that's a good one to focus on. But hope is very powerful. So a lot of times when people say they have faith in something, they really have hope. Let me give you an example. A really sad example happened last week up in Cincinnati. Our dear friend Carrie, formerly Seelig, who married uh, Randy Ashenbrenner, you know, their little two-year-old baby died. And we've had it in our bulletin. And of course, we, we've known Carrie before she got married. And some of us have seen Carrie after she's gotten married. Some of us have met Randy. And we see, we enjoy them very, very much. She's, she's just a sweet girl. And one thing Carrie is, Carrie, her blessing, her gift in life was that of being a mother. And so it's like, here's, here's, she's always, she, she got married a little later than some, and she wanted to get married, and she wanted to be a mother, and she finally, God blessed her with a marriage and a, and a baby, and her baby died. Now, if anyone's, if any of you say, now understand, I'm not, I'm not a good example about life, so if any of you tell me that Carrie didn't have faith, I'll probably punch you in the nose, so please don't, please don't say that. Please don't say that. Now, you can say, well, man, you shouldn't say things like that. No, I shouldn't, but you shouldn't say things like that either. Um, I, I'm not questioning. When Carrie was, and we were all praying for that baby, there was faith that God was involved and faith that God would hear and, and faith that God could, and could do whatever, and there was a tremendous amount of hope. But sometimes the things that we face, the trials we face, are, are huge, and we need God to help us not only in the trial, but after the trial because we're still going through it. And so the point is people express their, 
their faith and their hope, and that they express it in ways that are not really not really clear. They they sometimes don't reflect on what's accurate. So the point is, I think the big problem with faith is people mis misrepresent a promise. They they don't understand a promise. In other words, you look at God's law. I think a lot of people, when they either misunderstand faith or misapply faith, do not understand what the promise is. Now, what makes it here, I think that's what comes up here when it says, all that you say, we will do. The connection is, I think a lot of times we don't understand what God's saying. We misinterpret what God's saying. We misapply what God's saying. And, of course, that's something we try not, we try not to misunderstand faith. We try not to misunderstand what God says we should do. We try not to misunderstand his expectations. And I'll repeat again something that's a constant theme of mine. I don't think we should ever argue about, about being saved by grace. But where the discussions come in are what are God's expectations. My Baptist neighbors believe they're saved by grace. Actually, we agree on that. But where we would disagree, and we don't fight or argue because we're neighbors and we love each other, actually. In fact, I, I really appreciate the love that they show. Uh, some people say, does, does love only come through the Church of God? Are you kidding me? A lot of love comes through the Church of God, but there's a lot of Church of God people who are pretty cruel and mean to each other and are not reflecting God at all. But my loving Baptist neighbors, where we, we could disagree on is what are God's expectations? Now, we could either debate about that, which we choose not to do. We could fight about that, which we choose not to do. We could give each other room to follow their religion, which we choose to do. We find as much we have in common, and the kindness we show to each other is great. And I, there are a lot of people in the Church of God, too, I have that relationship with. But there are some in the Church of God I don't have that relationship with. But the point is, we can disagree, and we do disagree, on what the expectations are. But so if we make the statement like they made back then, I will do all that you say, we really mean that. And Pete, brethren, we should be people of conviction, but we should also be people of compassion. And one thing I'd say about this congregation is we're pretty good about giving people room to have a different view. We, we have people who attend here with different calendars. We have people who have different view of the sacred names. We have different view of a lot of different things, and we just don't have, that's just not an issue at all because we love each other as brethren, and we, sometimes we talk about it and sometimes we don't. We have people in this room who will not eat out on the Sabbath. We have people in this room who will eat out on the Sabbath, and those can be landmines of fighting, or they can just be friends saying difference of opinion, conviction, and compassion. But I'm just pointing out to you, when they said, all that you say we will do, we all believe that, but we don't always understand it's the same thing about all that he says. So again, we go through life learning. Have you learned a lot? Hey, do you think differently than you did 10 years ago? I hope so. If you said, I was baptized 40 years ago and I think exactly the same, you don't realize you should be embarrassed. You're, you're, you're embarrassing yourself because you're telling the whole world you haven't learned anything. You're telling people you haven't grown. You to, you're telling everyone you've had all the answers all along. And so again, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't get tossed to and fro. I have a lot of friends who do not get tossed to and fro. They don't flip from doctrine to doctrine or idea to idea. They share ideas with each other. They think about it. They pray about it. And sometimes they say they change their mind. And sometimes they say, I didn't change my mind, but my friend introduced me to something to think about. And again, to be honest, I think arguing over doctrine is kind of sad anyway. We got Brian Biggs in the hospital right now. And the last th thing he needs is for people to argue about doctrine to him. I, I, I have also, I mean, as, I, as I've mentioned before, I deal with broken people. Some of you deal with broken computers. Some of you deal with broken cars. Some of you deal with broken houses and plumbing. Some of you deal with broken air conditioners. My job, my life is dealing with broken people in different stages of being broken. And so the last thing when people are broken is to argue about some Hebrew word or to argue about some uh, Greek culture. I mean, those things can come up in discussion for edification, most certainly. But again, we want to help the best we can to help people get through this by relationship with God. And when they have that relationship with God, then as they keep growing, they learn what are God's expectations for them. Well, I'm going, I'm going slow here. 
Okay, I better jump ahead. I, I'm not going to go through the Ten Commandments in part because uh, we've covered those quite regularly. But I, will, I want to remind you in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, God spoke these words saying, I am the eternal your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He reminded them that he saved them. He reminded them that he delivered them. And then he lays out clear expectations of what he has. My children, my nation, my priest, here are ten things I want you to do. Now, we, again, like I said, we cover this a lot because our, our congregation loves the blessings of the Ten Commandments. We love teaching the blessings of the Ten Commandments to our children and to strangers if people want to talk about it. You know, I've made the comment, I, I made it last week again. Uh, when I deal with Church of God people, you know what I talk about a lot? Grace. The re why is that? Because a lot of the Church of God people, religious people, religious people need to focus more on grace because they, they know God's way, so they tend to judge each other. When I talk to people in society, you know what I talk about a lot? The law. The law of God. I'm not making this up. I've said this to you before. I've had a situation where a man came to me and he said, I'd like your help. I'd like your advice. I'm married and I have a girlfriend on the side. and I'm wondering what I should do about that. It was, I, would not, I was looking around for a show, see if my camera was on, if I was on candid camera or being pranked. I wasn't being pranked. In his world, the, the world he allowed himself to get into, that was a dilemma for him. So at that point, he needed some instruction as best I could. You know, I didn't want to beat him over the head, but I had to explain to him, there's a reason that that, that situation is causing you a problem. And you, you, know, you really don't, shouldn't be in that problem. Now, that's, that is my experience. My experience, when I deal with religious people... My, my dealing with religious people is be kind to each other. Don't, don't be so hard on them because they have a slightly different doctrine. Don't be so hard on them because they have a slightly different view of God. Don't be so hard on them because they have this or that's that. When I deal in society, which is more than half of my time is dealing with society, there are people, basic, I get to talk about basic laws of God that if they would follow those laws, that would make their life better. It would help fix their life, make them happy, give them peace. And so I don't know if that's your experience, because a lot of you deal with, in society. A lot of you deal in, in school districts and, and jobs and PTAs and all sorts of things, homeowners associations. And I don't know, maybe in some of those situations you deal with people who are religious and judgmental. But when you feel someone who's broken, see, I, I mentioned last week, I'd, I'd love to have a congregation of recovering alcoholics. I love dealing with recovering alcoholics. Recovery is the big point, because they're... Because when they're not recovering, boy, that's sad. That's rough. That's bad. I actually, I mean, yes, I'll, I'll deal with a, I will deal with a congregation of 100% self-righteous Pharisees, but that's, that's just not fun. Dealing with self-righteous Pharisees is not fun at all. They say, well, what about recovering alcoholics? Well, I don't know. When you see them change their life, I, I guess when you see a self-righteous Pharisee change his life or her life, that's bad. That's good, too, but... I don't know, it seems like you can make more progress with a recovering alcoholic than you can a judge, self-righteous Pharisee. But anyway, he gave them ten laws here, the ten great laws of God. Now in the judgments, we, I have on the judgments on the handout, I broke the judgments down, Exodus chapter 21, verse 1. These are the judgments which you shall set before them. Now these, it's interesting, on the handout I, put, I broke it down, and you can break it down differently. You may, you may organize it differently, because we all have our different organizational styles. But I broke the judgments down into the Hebrew slaves, the violent crimes, the property laws, laws for everyday life, and that kind of catches a lot of variance there. There's a segment I call equal justice for all, which is a very good principle. Uh, laws of worship. And then at the end of laws of promise and warning. Now I will share with you a, a discussion we had in the interactive Bible study. As the moderator, you know, my job is to keep it on track. Or I, sometimes I let it go adrift. Sometimes I even take it adrift. And uh, I, found, I let it go a little adrift there because uh, I was just interested. I was learning. And I, I like listening to people give their points of view. But one thing I would like to mention that I did ask the question in there. Do you consider the Ten Commandments on the same level 
as the judgments. And I would say that the comments that I heard, the first ones to comment, they, they put them on the same level. And so I would, I would assume if those were the, since those were the first comments in there, they may be the first comments or the majority comments here. But I, I, that's something I'm going to chew on a little bit because I, it was pointed out really well, clearly, that the Ten Commandments are the basic principles, but then the judgments define it a little more. They get more fill in the blanks. They, they fill in some of the details. And that certainly makes a lot of sense to me. But one thing that was brought up, and I, again, I'm not saying this is good. I'm just I'm sharing with you as your pastor and your friend. See, I don't view the Ten Commandments, or, or I don't view the law of speeding in an automobile on the same level as the Ten Commandments. Now, maybe the majority of you do feel that, and I certainly would, I'm, I'm going to ha have loved compassion toward you, but I've never considered that when I've gone 66 miles an hour. I didn't consider it on the same level as breaking the Sabbath. I didn't consider it on the same level as stealing or killing. I didn't. Now, something that, again, what we do is we plant seeds and we think about it. And, and that, why do I even bring it up? Why do I bring it up a potential flaw? Or why do I bring up something that you would consider a flaw? Why do I bring it up and open? Well, since we're supposed to think about things and ruminate on things, because either because you're not going to judge me, because you're, you're, you're a loving believer. You're not going to judge me. And so thereby you can think about it. And you may be one of those individuals, because the first comments were kind of on the same level, I don't view them exactly on the same level. That, I don't want to minimize the laws, especially the laws of God. I think that in that society, as a national law, as a nation, nation way, they set up how to have a judicial system. And we did talk in there, and I expressed my opinion in there, that I'm really so disappointed with our judicial system. I, to me, the, our, our government judicial system was my last hope for our government. That's the way I looked at it. I looked at it, I became disappointed with the legislative branch. I became disappointed with the executive branch. And I was hanging in there for the judicial branch. And of course, now with the activist judges and how one judge can overturn a, a law of Congress or an, even an executive order, it's like you have these, these ran, r random judges out there who can just disrupt the whole system. So our system's broken. We're looking forward to the kingdom when it will be made again. But so my, the judicial the, the judicial advance to me was the last hope of things. Not, not hope of God. God's the hope. But I mean, as far as people fixing it. But see, when you look at the, the judgments here of Exodus 21, 22, and 23, to me, I believe that was the judicial system set up. I do believe if our government or if England or Australia or Germany or Congo if any nation would set these up, I believe that that would be a good thing, although that is not the national culture that we're facing right now. And we, as it talks in there about what happens if you trespass, what happens if you steal. Now, but I point out to you, okay, I point out to you, think about this for a second. The Muslim nations, I have something in eye in the world that down in Mexico right now, there's a man running for office. He's not a Muslim. They're kind of similar in this regard. He's running for national office, and he is saying that if he's elected, he will have the, he will have the bad guy's hands cut off, whack their hand off. Then you hear about some of the Muslim nations who practice Sharia law. They will actually, in their countries, they will whack someone's hand off who steals. So when you see that, and you may have an, an attitude about that, you have to understand, if you look at some of the judgments of 21, 22, and 23, they're pretty strict. They're pretty firm. And so they, I think we'd be better off. I like the Bible ones. I'm, I'm not as, I don't know the origins of the Mexican candidate or the Sharia law. I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. But I'm just saying is some of these are pretty strict. You know, even back in that time, they stoned people, which, you know, the whole issue of capital punishment is pretty controversial. They don't do it by stoning. They're doing it more by lethal injection today. But so, again, I'm just telling you my perspective as your friend, knowing that some of you, maybe the majority of you may not agree with me on this, but I view, these, I view the judgments of 21, 22, and 23 as very valuable, very important, good for a nation, something that would be better if people would set up. 
But I, per I personally view the Ten Commandments as a means of something that more applies to me, more applicable to me. Now, if you don't agree with it, that's fine. If you want, if you want to put the level of the judgments on the same level, I certainly will honor your, your choice. I will honor that's your choice in life. Just understand there'll be people like myself who may not look at it quite the same way. Now, having said that, just because I don't put them on the same level as the Ten Commandments, I think they're very, very valuable. I, I think they're great. I think they're well planned, well thought out. And we would be more blessed as a people if we would practice these kind of things of these judgments. Well, you'll have time again later on after the study to look through those judgments and see that they were given to the people as part of their national covenant, what they would do. Now let's get to the, the formal ratification of the covenant, chapter 24. The formal ratification of the covenant. Now he said to Moses, 24.1, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nabal and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. So Moses alone shall come near me, and they, they shall not come near me, nor shall the people go with him. They, you know, only I come up here. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice saying, similar words again, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. And that's basically what you're saying at baptism. All the words of the Lord I will do. And again, as we said earlier, now we have to, how we understand the words of the Lord is how we are different. And how we learn from God directly and how we learn from others, people we consider pillars or elders, someone who we consider as leaders. You learn from, like Priscilla and Aquila, you learn from men and women in the congregation. It was Priscilla and Aquila who helped shape Apollos. So again, you learn from sharp people. You're looking for sharp people. Whether they have a title or not, whether they have a designation or not, it's not important. You rec you, people you... you, you you admire people who inspire you, people who help you, you learn from them. But what we're saying is all the words which the Lord has said, I will do, that's the covenant. So now we try to learn the words of the Lord and we try to live by those words of the Lord. I like verse 4, a couple things Moses did. He wrote all the words down, but he rose early in the morning and built an altar and he built 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent the young men in to offer burnt offerings and peace offerings. That's good. There's some things better for a young man to do. I, I love when young men do things that I, a 65-year-old, don't want to do anymore. I think it's great. They lift things that I don't even want to try to lift anymore. Yeah, and I just like my days of lifting those heavy things are over. And so I don't, I don't want them to get hurt, but we really appreciate their youth, their vitality, their energy. But then again, Moses took the blood of the sacrifices. We don't do sacrifices. Any of you listening in on the internet, if, if you stumbled across this congregation, we do, do not do animal sacrifices. We recognize Christ as our sacrifice. He's our Passover lamb. We recognize that heavily. And he, he fulfills all the rules, actually. He's the high priest and the, and the sacrificial lamb. He's the apostle. He's everything. So that, this congregation very much is involved with looking at the Father and the Son looking at them as directing our lives and adding to our life. But we learn from this to see what the sacrificial system was and seeing how Christ fulfilled that in these days. But back then, Moses took the, half the blood, put it in basins, took the other half of the blood and put it on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and he read it at the hearing of the people. And guess what they said? All that the Lord has said we will do and we will be obedient. That is what we said at baptism. All that God says we will do. And that's why I hope you're taking time every day studying the Word of God. Yes, you read other things. Yes, you're busy people. It doesn't have, it's kind of like losing weight or learning how to shoot a basketball or learning how to sing a song or learning how to play the piano. You do a little bit every day. Every day it's a part of your life. And hopefully part of the Bible, reading the Bible is a part of your life every day. I know you're busy. I know you've got other important things to do. Don't skimp on the other important things, but don't skip on your Bible study. So anyway, he took the blood, he sprinkled it, and then uh, he did according to the words. Verse 9, Moses went up, also Aaron and the 70 elders, and they saw the God of Israel. 
And there was under his feet, as it were, a, a paved work of sapphire, stone, and it was like the very heavens in its, cl its clarity. Now, on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not l lay his hand. But they saw God, and they ate and drank. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the mountains and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone, and I will give you the law, I will give you the commandments which I have written. I want you to teach them. And I want us to learn, a break from the reading, I want us to learn that we learn these things to be teaching them, not forcing it down people's throat. In fact, as a teacher, there's two ways to look at it. This is a subject all in itself. You want to have the right material first, and secondarily, you want to have effective ways of presenting it. There are some people who are effective teachers, but they don't have the right material. If, if an effective teacher is teaching abortion, that's horrible. They are effectively teaching the wrong material. But there are some people who have the right material, but they're not really good teachers. It's kind of like a doctor. I want a doctor who is skilled and a doctor who communicates well. If I have to take a choice, I want one who's skilled. When I had my heart surgery two years ago, we, we, you know, I ha ha was happy to, I happened to pick my own surgeon. Happened to find I had a week before I had my heart surgery. And we, I did research and I found one, he's very skilled. And he was also a good communicator because he made my wife feel safe and comfortable. Because my wife was nervous and he, would, he was very calm. But I'd rather have a skilled doctor first, even if he's rude. I can deal with his rudeness. But if I'm going to have someone whacking on me, now, if I have a mechanic, I want a mechanic who's skilled. But it's nice if he communicates well, too, or she communicates well, too. But if, if someone's a good talker but a lousy mechanic, that's not going to help you out. If someone's a good talker and not a good surgeon, that's not going to help you out. So I want someone who is skilled first, and then hopefully they're also a good communicator. And they're out there. You can find them. But anyway, God gives us these laws and commandments. We want to know the right material. But hopefully we're getting better at expressing ourselves. We're getting better at planting seeds. We're getting better at helping people who don't know God. We're getting better at people who question God. We're getting better at people who are argumentative. I mean, if someone argues with you and you just argue back with them, it may not be the best way to teach. Anyway, my time is up, so I just want to go to the last verse. He was up there 40 days and 40 nights. Anyway, so I gave you this little bit today from Exodus 19 through 25. We'll continue with our series. If you'll bow your heads, we'll ask God's dismissal. Our loving Father in heaven, Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about your way of life. There's so much powerful things in your, in your word, so many good things even in the scriptures we looked at today. Please help others today be motivated to study these verses and to learn what you want them to learn. And let them be, not only learn the good information from you, but that they'll also find ways to better teach to others so we can fulfill our purpose of glorifying your name. Father, we look forward to your kingdom. We want to reflect your kingdom. We want to reflect your way of light we give you thanks for all that you do in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.